Hey friends, it's Melvin. Thanks for tuning into this episode. Here's just a few quick things I wanted to notify you guys about before we get started. First up, very soon, new episodes will be releasing Wednesday mornings rather than Tuesday. So don't panic if you don't see a new episode on Tuesday. Just wait a little longer and you'll see it in your feed. Second, we've introduced a mailbag. Check those show notes and toward the bottom you'll see a mailbag link. You'll then be able to text us any questions you might have about movies, the movie industry, or any movie slash Christian related questions you might have. Then we'll respond in a future episode, so send us your questions now. Up next, Patreon polls, which are available to Patreon supporters at the $3 tier or higher, have been updated. Supporters can now suggest films or shows to be reviewed at the end of each month. The two most liked submissions will become the options for the Patreon poll, so if you want to hear us talk about your favorite movie or show, join our Patreon and start campaigning. And lastly, whether you're a new or long-time listener, please consider writing a review or rating the Cinematic Doctrine podcast on iTunes and Spotify. Apart from financially supporting on Patreon, these are the two most helpful ways to support the show. And that's it. Enjoy the episode. You're listening to Cinematic Doctrine. So, hey, if you just press play, you're missing out on 34 minutes of us talking about two particular things of equal importance. Um, the first thing. <laughs> I think so, Melvin. The, the first thing is board games. <laughs> we talk about board games, Magic the Gathering. It was a secret. It's a secret of mine. I don't like board games. That's not a secret. I don't enjoy them right now. But I also own several board games. And the reason is because there was a time where I was playing a lot of them, uh, all different kinds, exploring them. I still really like Magic the Gathering. But we talk about board games, those dynamics, um, and kind of what makes it fun. Um, and I share a couple of stories about that. But that was not our main topic. What we really intended to talk about is um, there was that viral clip of a megachurch pastor who was getting angry that people were coming in late, leaving early, not being engaged with the community, choosing to watch the live stream over the service, um, coming to the service. We in particular didn't really want to talk about that so overtly because we want to be careful about slander. We want to be careful about the fact that in the future they may get to know the Lord more and become gentler. And therefore this thing that they're probably, if that happens, they become ashamed about. We don't want to necessarily just pull at that, right? So we want to be careful about that. But we did want to talk about the idea of like, okay, but is it, what is the dynamics of someone coming in late or leaving early or maybe not being engaged in community? So we talk about why it's important to be engaged. We talk about what can maybe be done to make changes if you're seeing that people are in your community coming in late and not particularly caring or changing. Um, it's an interesting conversation because yeah, if you have, even if you have a party, like it doesn't feel good when people come, like nobody comes until 10, 20 minutes later and it's not like people go to movies late. So like, it's just an interesting conversation to think about. I say as somebody who often shows up to the movie about two minutes late, so (laughs) I, I, uh, I really push it. Um, but uh, you get to support on Patreon uh, for $3 a month and get access to that on cut episodes all the time. Um, there's usually 20 to 30 to 40 minutes of extra content on all these episodes. It's pretty cool. There's other support benefits. So check them out by going to the Patreon and reading about it or continuing to listen to this episode because you'll hear about it every couple of minutes, every 10 or 20 minutes. Um, we'll cut in and let you know about it. So, But you press play to hear us talk about Barbie as the princess and the pauper, which was selected by our Patreon supporters. So another reason to support on on there is you get to pick movies. Um, We're doing a party pleaser episode because if we didn't, this episode would be very short. (laughs) Um, We're going to be doing a party pleaser episode, which is one of the two of us will be describing the movie from beginning to end. So if you haven't seen it, that's fine. We're going to carry you through it. We're going to cut in with commentary because we'll have thoughts to share or maybe some laughs to be had. Um, And then at the end, we will decide if this movie is a party pleaser, worthy of watching with friends and having a good time, or a party pooper, skip out on it or never see it and whatever. But it should be a fun time regardless. So the movie opens up and it is... (laughs) 
overwhelming with the plot. Um, I started it and immediately paused it, sighed, and went, I have so many notes to take. <laughs> it is like <laughs> Dragon Ball Evolution. Uh, where, oh, man. <laughs> well, we talked about Dragon Ball Evolution, another good episode. Go check it out. Um, I had I was taking the notes for that one, too. And it's like the beginning starts, and I had to immediately pause it because it's just an info dump of the world we are about to enter. Yes. So let me let me get it. Let me try and get into this. Okay. So the magical butterfly swirl around and tell us some backstory. Um, it says is it the butterflies talking. I don't know, but it could have been. Okay. I don't. Maybe, was it the queen? Maybe I don't know. I thought maybe it was the queen. Continue. It's fine. <laughs> I was just. <laughs> it's, it's, so, it won't change anything. I was just curious. In a far-off, digitally-painted kingdom, there was a day when two identical babies who were not twins were born, one to the king and the queen, her name was Annalise, and one to the poors, her name is Erica. Uh, Annalise would grow up to become a ruling princess, Erica would grow up to become a skilled seamstress whose boss is a nag, her name is Madame Carp. We cut to the royal mines, we find out that all of the gold has gone out and is just there's just nothing left. So we find that the entire kingdom has gone poor because there's no gold. So I guess they're what's interesting is the movie starts with very simple stuff, but then as the plot develops, it becomes much more politically complicated. Oh my goodness. um, Which I thought was interesting, but all that to say is we can ascertain that this entire economy is based on gold and their trade with other companies or other, other companies. Gosh, I'm a capitalist, Uh, (laughs) other kingdoms. They don't have anything else worth. They have nothing else to offer. Just gold. We also learn that the queen is now a widow. That's just that's just now there. There's no gold. We have mines. to explain why she doesn't have a man. Yeah, basically. And also, like, I guess it. Uh, oh yeah, pl- I guess it is plot relevant now that I think about it. So, um, the queen wanted to ask a man named Preminger, who was not around. Uh, we then cut to a f- painting of Preminger, and immediately you go, "Bad guy." Oh, that's the villain. <laughs> 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 like that's the bad he guy. He looks like oh a creep. <laughs> Ew, he's like he's he's played by Martin Short, and of course they he's also make his character awesome. very short. Yeah, he's really good in this. His his voice acting is a ton of fun. There were a couple of reads that I thought were objectively very funny. Um, <laughs> he really uses the full spectrum of the voice. Mm. And the queen needs to find a way to have the kingdom not go poor and then ultimately lose its power. So she decides that, uh, you know, I have this daughter, Annalise. I will marry her off to a neighboring kingdom, and then that kingdom will support us. So we are just jumping right into it. And the funniest part is that when she the queen comes up with this idea, it pans over to Annalise, who is our Barbie doll, by the way, um, both Annalise and Erica. Uh, when it pans over to Annalise, after the queen says, I'll marry her off, Annalise is like brushing her hair and just looks up and smiles. So it just looks like uh, she has no idea what's about to happen to her. It's terrible. (laughs) (laughs) It's so bad. Oh, man. So the movie starts when we get our first song. It is called Free. This is five minutes in. Uh, Annalise is trying. Let me first I'll describe the contents of the songs. And then you and I will talk about the songs because I think, you know, we don't talk about musicals a lot on the podcast. And I've. I actually kind of really like musicals. I can't watch them all the time. Really? That's a lot of music, but I do like musicals a lot. Okay. And so it'll be fun to talk about this music, but let me explain the contents of it, the plot that we learn. So Annalise is trying on this wedding gown, knowing that she has to get married. Erica is currently sewing a gown. Uh, I made a chart. It's basically the two circles chart where they converge together. Uh, So first we get Annalise. Annalise does not want to marry the prince. Annalise is learning uh, that materialism is not everything. And Annalise says, because uh, the the prince, who she has not met yet, keeps sending gifts. She has a lyric that's like, with every gift, strings are attached, that not all gifts are kindness. Um, the not all gifts are kindness is not a lyric. It's just, just me explaining it. Mm-hmm. Um, but Annalise very much wants to have independence, be free, um, not be connected to that. Erica, her thing is, she has to pay off her parents' debt to her boss, Madame Carp. Um, so I guess her parents have died. So now she's taken on the debt of her parents. And then she might have a plan to escape or overcome the trial. We don't know. We'll find out as the plot develops. But the two of them both um, have similar lyrics. And this is a duet song. It's really cool. Um, both yearn for freedom. And they both understand that duty sometimes includes things you don't like. 
which I thought was a really interesting detail to include. Um, Mm -hmm. I thought that was immediately I went, oh, that's really mature. (laughs) Like (laughs) that they're doing these things that they don't want to, but they recognize that it's good to do them was just really yeah uh, there's a lot of these like little nuggets of just you can tell they were very intentional when they like included them like they're not just lyrics just for the sake of lyrics it's like you can tell they know kids are watching so they want it to be as educational or clear or encouraging as possible so i did appreciate that it was oddly in a positive way oddly complicated a lot of the lyrics and the specific details Again, to bring up Beckman, here is another movie that does it better than Beckman because this movie at least trusts that even children are smart enough to keep up. And yet Beckman Absolutely. is like, I had to cut to a cut scene because I thought people would be bored. <laughs> it's like, no, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> come on. Yeah. I just, so I, I like that. Um, but the song, Free, what did you think about the song, Mrs. Music teacher. With this song in particular, I did like it. I liked it because it was very clear about what each character was feeling and about what they really just greatly desired for themselves. And it it set you up for the the switch that was going to happen. But it was definitely not what I expected, which I also did like. Like as you realize, like. So I thought the switching was going to be... Oh, you're talking about plot. Okay, we'll, the, we'll, like the we'll plot. get to that. I thought the plot was yeah. good. But the song itself, I thought it was really cute. I thought the singers were actually really good. Oh my gosh, they're great. It's super clean vocals. So I thought the singing was really, really great. And here's And this was something that I wanted to bring up. So this is a great example of how you have an actor do the acting and a singer do the singing. Yes. Thank you. Yes. You can Carrie, get the best yes. of both. Not The actor doesn't have to do... No. everything and i understand that there are actors that can do everything and it's very very wonderful but when you're animating you don't have to you don't have to have the voice actor do the singing too it might yes. cost like there might be different costs and different like residuals because you're having different actors but like yeah so here Kelly sheridan um does the voice for princess annalise and erica and while watching the movie i also learned that kelly sheridan basically voiced barbie from 2001 to 2010 and then came back from 2012 to 2015. So a bunch of the movies, um, Kelly Sheridan mm. was doing Barbie's voice. But then whenever Annalise or Erica sing, Melissa Leones uh, does for Annalise and Julie Stevens does for Erica. And mm-hmm. so they have different singers. But it's fine. Like, it's fine. There needs yes. to be distinction in the voice anyway, because they are also different characters. Absolutely. Um, but then it also means that now when they're singing, they can sing different that yeah. stuff because one person is still kind of limited by what their voice can reach <laughs> so mm-hmm. um yeah it makes the duet a lot more enjoyable while the two of them are singing together hey don't forget there's a lot of fun content missing from this episode because you're not listening on patreon head over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine and support for three dollars a month to gain access to uncut episodes with upwards of 40 minutes of bonus content each you'll thank me later I was just happy that the song gave us a lot of information and detail about multiple characters because sometimes music and musicals can be very singular and then the plot is stuck for now three minutes while we finish the song. So Mm. that was appreciated. Um, But moving on. um, Oh, I I wrote a note. I just said the duet was good and the bridge for the song was also really good. Um, But Mm -hmm. anyways, um, the minds, we cut to the minds. Uh, I just had a note. The animation throughout this movie looks like a pre-rendered Resident Evil cutscene. Uh, at some <laughs> point, you get used to that. And I do appreciate it insofar as these <sighs> these Barbie dolls are dolls. They're plastic. And then the animation has a plastic doll-like look to it. So I thought that was cute. I, I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. It's a little off-putting just for yeah. me just because <laughs> I was like, we're so spoiled now with Pixar. Minus the flash, but we're so we're so spoiled with like really really great animation. Yeah. Um, it's just sometimes it just feels weird to go back when it's less polished, less polished. But it's but again, it wasn't unexpected. Like no. you have these movies that were being made so close. I don't know how close together they were, but you have this succession of Barbie movies where it's like you know they just they're not going to have the time to make it as lifelike. But just like you said, it's also 
could be a style thing where it's like they want it to look like the doll. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was fine. You get used to it. You get over it. You get very used to it. But you also can tell which character model, which like models in the movie had more complicated skeletal models than other ones. Because like Barbie, very animated expression has great expressions like they really have a lot of Mm -hmm. articulation on their on their face and body but then some of the side characters are like (laughs) gosh it's like i'm so sorry you were born it's just bad terrible it's really like the henchmen (laughs) (laughs) they just did not look good no they're like constantly moving like ragdolls it's really terrible yeah uh, but, okay, so we're now in the mines, and it turns out Preminger has some lackeys who are stealing gold from the mines. We get into song two. It is our villain song. I did not look up the song list, and I went on Spotify, and there was they did not have the songs uploaded, but someone made a podcast where they just uploaded the songs as a podcast. Oh. So I wasn't sure if they were the correct names. They probably were, but I still just sort of wrote down what I suspected the names were. So song number two, I called How Can I Refuse? This comes nine minutes in. Um, Preminger, so here's the content of the, of the song. Preminger has been stealing from the kingdom's mind. He has a plan. Essentially, he will have been doing business outside of the kingdom. He's going to, um, have these lackeys steal all the gold and store it somewhere that Preminger can collect it. Then Preminger will return to the kingdom and say, I have all this gold and I can save the kingdom. Um, and in doing so, he thinks then he will say, I will give all my gold to the kingdom. You have to give me Annalise as my wife. Preminger does not know, though, that Annalise is currently being given away to another king to save the kingdom. So he has to amend his plan. So in the final verse of the song, he says, I'll have somebody abduct Annalise. And then while she's abducted, I will then find her and save her. And then how can they refuse to marry me when I save their life? And he'll also return with the gold, too, and save the kingdom. What we kind of learn about Preminger's character is that he's very, very smart. can think on his feet. He's very cunning, but he's also slimy. And also, we learn that during one of the particular scenes during this animation, uh, I have a note of it. Um, at 10 minutes and 44 seconds, there is a wide shot or, or a close-up shot of a dog. And Preminger sings to the dog, his dog named Midas. But when he leans down to sing to the dog... You can see right through his chest. His chest did not get rendered for the scene. All of that there is his arms and the head. (sighs) So you could just see the wall behind him as he floats down to to sing to it. I like had to rewind it and catch it. And Catherine was like, oh my gosh, where's his chest? Where'd it go? (laughs) Oh man. The one distinction that makes it more clear is that his jacket has layers. And on Mm -hmm. the side, there's like a thread that goes down and that thread rendered, but not like the chest lapel and like the, the button up and everything. So it's like, it's odd. It's really the only animation error in the movie. Everything else is pretty clean and crisp insofar as it looks like a Resident Evil cutscene. but that it, it was probably a case of, we rendered it, we put it up and then we went, Oh no, we don't have time to render this again. It takes six weeks to do. So we just, we'll just use it. it. So. But I digress. The song, what'd you think of this villain song? Um, I mean, it's Martin Short. I feel like he's always going to deliver and like really mm-hmm. like sell you on something. Um, yeah, I thought it was really cute. I liked, uh, again, trying to just remember as much as I can because it, it takes me a while to like really <laughs> Melanie like... Melanie has watched this in the last 24 hours. <laughs> right. And it's just like... So... <laughs> <laughs> They're having difficulty remember. I mean, admittedly, I have difficulty remembering dinner from last night. So, so that's fair. <laughs> here's what I think is happening, and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna put it out there. I think the movie the because I was gonna save it for like towards more towards the end what my thoughts were on the film, but I'm realizing it's just it's a very cute film. There were just several things I just found to be very unmemorable. I just feel like I should, I should remember more about the, I did remember the first song and there is a song <laughs> later that I, re, that I'll, we'll talk about when we get there that I was like, I actually really like this song a lot. I wonder if it's the same one that I also really like. I, I hope so. <laughs> so, but with this villain song, I just, I mean, again, Martin Short's a great performer, but the song itself, I was kind of just like, meh, whatever. It wasn't very memorable for me. I All of the songs teach us a lot about the characters and this one in particular i think is very efficient in doing so i really enjoyed that like it 
it kicks off. We get some, it's very bouncy and fun and it has parts where it slows down and then it kicks and picks up as the verse continues. It becomes the tempo goes faster. Um, and there's, this is like the first, like in the previous song, there isn't a lot of, I don't know how to call it dancing (laughs) because it's like, so they're so like spindly and, and rubbery, but like there's dancing in this one. That's kind of fun. And it's actually the first time where I thought like, because the princess and the pauper, the original or the prince and the pauper, the original story, I don't think is actually very complicated. Um, This one came up and I thought to myself, like this would, this has so much plot and so much event that is being promised as we continue the story that I thought like this would be an interesting movie to just see or an interesting story to see performed as a musical anyway, because there's so much activity to be done. So yeah, all in all, I think it's a pretty good villain song. Um, It's not great, but it's a good one. You may not know this, but the easiest way you can show your support for Cinematic Doctrine is to rate and review the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen. So press pause and share your thoughts. We'd love to hear what you have to say. And then press play again so you can hear the rest of the show. So we now cut to the castle. Preminger has a fancy dog and the animals talk, which made me very happy. <laughs> um, that was super, super cool. Very cute. We learned that the dog's name is Midas. We also learned that the cat's name is Serafina. An ambassador for King Dominic arrives, noticeably handsome model, probably our Ken doll. Um, Annalise is caught off guard by the ambassador's arrival so early, um, so she has to start getting prepared. Um, the ambassador first meets with the queen to deliver a gift. We learn that King Dominic is going to uh, expedite the wedding by a week. Um, Preminger is caught off guard, realizing that this is going to happen in the next week, so he knows that he has to abduct Annalise earlier. Annalise watches longingly over the kingdom, uh, yearning for her freedom, and she's watching the common people, uh, saying, I wish I had what they had. This is when I paused the movie and I read the lyrics to Pulp's Common People. (laughs) Um, uh, And then, in all seriousness, though, um, what Annalise really wants is um, to find someone that she can love, not someone that is arranged for her marriage. Um, So, Although I am having fun with the whole common people thing. Um, so she goes to town with her, um, assistant. It's like a servant she has who's named Julian. I don't, we didn't get that name until like 70 minutes into the movie. Right. So I just kept writing assistant, assistant, assistant on here. Um, <laughs> but, uh, Annalise and Serafina visit the town with their, with Julian. Uh, she's wearing a cloak so that nobody recognizes her and she's able to go into the town and no one actually recognizes her anyway. So she's right. able to enjoy time there. Midas is sneaking behind them. Uh, the dog. Uh, Annalise is learning and observing about the townsfolk and their situation. For instance, she talks about like, where did, where did Julian grow up? And Julian actually just says, I didn't have a home. I grew up in a room with a bunch of other people. And then I worked my way up to where I am now. And she apologizes for uh, being rude about it. Um, she wasn't uh, really, she just said like, where right. was your house? She just feels sorry. Yeah. She also sees that another family is boarding up their home. Uh, and so she's learning that, you know, being so independent isn't actually so great. And by independent, what she believes is independence is actually just struggling. Um, So yeah, I thought that was interesting too. Um, I I won't keep saying that every time they do something mature, but just know that like the movie doesn't stop peppering in little details like that. Like the plot has a lot more to do than just, we're going to swap two people, one who's poor and one who's rich. Like there's, there's a lot of stuff. Right. You can tell there was some thought. There's yeah. not some thought, like a lot of thought that was put yes. into it, which I actually did appreciate. I thought that was a plus for sure. It's just nice to watch kids content that treats children like, um, like there's that interview with um, Mr. Rogers who talks about like children are just small adults. They have full mm-hmm. emotions. They just don't know what to do with them, which frankly mm-hmm. sounds just like an adult. <laughs> so um, yeah. yeah, there's something to appreciate <laughs> about a piece of media made for children accessible to children that also treats them uh, as people. And I, I like that, especially too, when these are toys that they're buying, because it can Mm -hmm. also, apart from the fun that is uh, smashing your dolls together saying now kiss, there is also (laughs) like something about the fact that like, they are yes, and I do do that with my Michael Myers and my Jason Voorhees dolls, uh, dolls action so figures. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, and my Ray figure over in the cabinet. 
But um, there is something about the fact <laughs> that this film right. is like terrible, isn't it? It's like my Jason Voorhees fan fiction where <laughs> he meets up with Ray. <laughs> I just pictured a little Melvin, but your little Melvin still had a beard. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, watching it's movies so like Dead Alive at, at nine years old. <laughs> That's because I didn't watch the Barbie movie as a kid. <laughs> if I did, I would be so much more well developed. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I wasn't great. expecting to laugh so much. That's so funny. Melanie has cried every episode we've recorded for the last four months, either because something has emotionally touched her or disturbed her or made her laugh. Oh, my um, goodness. Uh, I got to, like, buy you a Sindoc water bottle so you don't get so dehydrated every time we record. Oh, sounds good. You can catch your tears. Um <laughs> <laughs> but there's something metatextually <laughs> to appreciate about the fact that this movie has so much maturity and kindness to say Melanie had to mute. <laughs> Melanie muted themselves because they literally cannot stop laughing. I'm sorry. <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> it's like I have the giggles. <laughs> <laughs> oh I just gosh. keep seeing it. It's <laughs> like a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> Melvin happy as a child is so disturbing and upsetting. No, it's just, I just laughed because little Melvin still had a beard. No, it's like why? Am I dragging the beard? Is it as long as no? It is now? You were just your <laughs> beard is long. It's almost longer than the length of my head. No. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm done. Earlier this week, Catherine said, "I don't even know where your chin is." <laughs> <laughs> I like put my hand up. I was like, it's right here. <laughs> it's right there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Now my face is hurting from smiling. Enjoying this episode? Grab that share link and tell your friends. Word of mouth is the most effective way for a podcast to reach new listeners. So don't be shy. Share the episode wherever you can. All that to say is, I think there's something sweet about the fact that this movie is a product tagged onto the toys, which is fun. And by being in ed- by being in not necessarily a movie that's educational, but is socially educational because it's teaching about pretty complicated topics that are social. Mm-hmm. And then the kids are going to go play with those toys, and they're going to potentially imitate what was happening in the movie. Like yes. I kind of think that there's something really cool about that and something kind about that so i really appreciated that throughout the film i feel like there are these really again there was an intentionality to it and not a carelessness with the content that they want to share keeping in mind with exactly what you just said that children will be playing with this because i did that too when i would play with action figures i would be like reenacting what i saw in a movie so like um uh my brother david had a um figurine of Godzilla when Mm -hmm. the Matthew Broadwick um, Godzilla came out. And I remember like doing all the things that the Godzilla would do, you know, but it's like, but this one, it's more nuanced because it's not just a monster opening its mouth up and down and moving its arms up and down like this. It was, you know, these are actual people. So you're going to probably imitate those conversations. Additionally, they're recognizing that the Barbie doll is aspirational. Mm -hmm. Um, not just in figure, which is what people often stick to, which I think is, um, I I can understand, but, but also in terms of character. And so by giving this doll a character and, and complicated development, I think that there's something really wonderful to that. While Annalise is out in the town, we finally 20 minutes in have their meeting, which I thought this was interesting. Barbie doesn't, well, Annalise doesn't really have a primary scene until about 15 minutes in. She's kind of almost side characters. We're setting up other stuff. And then finally, when she gets started, it still takes till the 20 minute mark for her to meet, for Annalise to meet Erica. So Annalise overhears yeah. Erica singing in the in the park. Um, not a full song, just a brief one. So I didn't make a note. But um, the uh, Madam Carter. Trying to make some in. money. 
yeah, she's trying to make money and Madam Carp comes in to take the money saying you still owe me and you're not going to make any money singing because you're no good. And then takes the money that she made. <laughs> yes, <laughs> takes all of it. Um, Madam Carp. Annalise then gives her some money um, and says you were, what you were doing was very beautiful. And then when she takes her uh, mask, when she takes her cape off, the two of them recognize that they look exactly like each other. They're like, we could be sisters. We wouldn't even know it. And then Annalise, interesting, says she's the princess, of course. And then Erica says, I'm an indentured servant. And she's like, an indentured servant? Like, she's never heard of what that is before. She thought that was funny. So anyway, song three, <laughs> I'm a girl like you. Uh, twenty. That's what I called it. Uh, 21 minutes in. So content-wise, this song is a song of mutual experience. Even though Annalise and Erica are financially and socially desperate, the two have some looks, same looks, similar interests, yearn for independence, are responsible and other-oriented, and also they're well-educated in their particular fields. So Erica is a really well-educated seamstress, and uh, Annalise, we've actually noticed throughout the movie, she has studied in ye old STEM um, and uh, knows a lot about um, like science and particular topics. Mm-hmm. The only difference really is uh, physically, there's a birthmark on Annalise's shoulder and then their hair color. Um, before I continue, thoughts on the song. What do you think about this song? I just I just generally rem- remember them singing together. And I mm-hmm. do like I like their interaction together. And I think yeah. they sound really, really nice as well. Yes, they cast good singers together because um, the they song did. really simultaneously sounds like two people who are the same person singing, but also not. It, it's really yeah. it's it's oddly complicated too, even the music. It, it, it's a movie that is like deceptive in how good it is in certain qualities and aspects not to allude to my thoughts at the end already but like there's just a lot that as you watch it and continue to watch it you will just you're waiting for the point where it will kind of settle down and go to the expectation you had for it and it never quite gets it at least to me so anyways the servant returns and see uh julian julian returns and sees that uh the two of them are basically the same and is shocked by it. Um, but then the scene is cut short as, um, wait, no, what was my note? Oh, I just, I thought I was making a new header for what was next. I didn't. I was just so shocked that I wrote all in capitals. I said, <laughs> the cat barks. <laughs> yeah. Erica's cat barks. <laughs> That's a messed up cat. <laughs> Which is cute, but also shocking. Yes. This is when I wrote a note briefly that was just i like when there's talking animal movies and then rather than cutting in actual sounds of the animals they clearly just have the voice actor make the noise right that's what voice actors can do so mm. it's very clear that midas is the voice actor barking and uh seraphina is the voice actor meowing and here erica is the voice actor i'm sorry um erica's cat is a voice actor barking as a cat it's just super interesting um, animal hijinks ensues. That is that. Okay, so moving on. Uh, Preminger, the abduction takes place. Preminger's uh, lackeys, Nick and dot, dot, dot. We only know one of their names right. um, so far. Uh, Preminger has the lackeys abduct Annalise, and they take her to a hut in the woods, a cabin in the woods. Serafina is there, and she overhears that Preminger is the one behind the abduction. Serafina then talks with a nearby horse. A talking horse, I write in notes. Nice! <laughs> um, to help her break into the hut. Uh, the scene ends after Serafina gets inside. We cut to the castle, and there's a note on Annalise's desk. The queen learns about a note um, where Annalise has written that she ran away to avoid the marriage. Uh, of course, Preminger is the one who finds the right. note, so we know that uh, it's probably Preminger who made the note. Julian recognizes that the stationery is scented with lilac, and he knows that Annalise never scented anything with lilac. She always scented with, with rose. Only with rose. So she, he knows what's up. Okay, so The Good Guy Plan is the title that I wrote for this one. Julian visits Erica and says, I suspect Preminger has abducted Annalise. Come to the castle and impersonate Annalise. This will throw off Preminger's plan, and he may possibly reveal himself. Which actually seems like a great idea. Yeah, right? Like, it would like, just be like... Okay, that's uh-huh. smart. It's a good way to take the the premise of The Prince and the Pauper and have the two switch. Like, it, it's more yes. than just, let's just switch because we can. Because we, we want different lives. Like, it's... Yeah. So the two recognize that there's risk of execution. So we're putting in stakes and threat, which I appreciate. Um, mm-hmm. But they observe that it's the it's going to be a good thing to do. So we get into song four. 
how to be a princess. And doesn't she even say she's a girl like me? Is that when she says that? I think so. That- that's why she wants to help her. Yeah. It's there or somewhere else. And I'm just like, I really like that. Whoever, would, wherever that happens in the movie, I, I think it's there, but I don't remember. What in particular do you like about it? Each of them really does seem to to respect the other. And I like that even though they were from different classes, um, they realized that no matter what your context there are things that we share. There doesn't have to be this rift between us where we can't respect one another or be friends. Yeah. I, I kind of like that she was still willing to to help her. And even early on in the movie, I know that the Annalise was willing to help Erica by having her sing at the castle and she was going to call on her to have her come. Yes. So it wasn't just like, all right, nice to meet you. Bye. She was like, no, I'm going to help you out because... Yeah. You're a girl like me. So um, I really I really liked that mutual respect and that desire that they had to help one another. Want some quick updates on the podcast? Follow the Cinematic Doctrine Instagram for cool posts and story updates. Press the link in the show notes or search Cinematic Doctrine, that's one word, in your Instagram app. Oh, and we're on threads. Check us out there, too. Yes, and that's pretty much what motivates Erica uh, to step in and help things out because she cares about Annalise. Um, so first off, uh, contents of the song, I said, "Clever." The rule book is play is um, the rule book on how to be a princess because Erica needs to learn how to be a princess is placed on a stand, and the stand looks like a music stand. And mm-hmm. we're about to go into a song, which I thought was pretty yeah. clever. Um, we get some clever puns and cute lines about being proper, smart, and presentable. Also, we learned that Annalise's assistant in the third verse, they keep doing this in the movie, which I think is good use of musical uh, storytelling. The third verse is used to introduce something new. And the third verse, the last verse of this song, uh, we learned that Annalise's assistant, Julian, may have feelings for Annalise. Um, And that's when I went, oh, he's another Ken doll. (laughs) Yes. Um, (laughs) And uh, but he looks like Scout from Team Fortress 2, which I thought was kind of funny. Uh, But anyways, um, that was a good uh, usage of the last verse. But I did think that the song ended on an anticlimactic lyric. I can't remember it in particular, but it is surprising how anticlimactic the lyric is. Thoughts on the song. What do you think? I thought it was really cute. You know, you always have these um, light, more bubbly, more um, yes, animated one, yeah. like songs that you want to kind of add variety. So I did like that not every song sounded the same. This one I thought was really cute. Definitely puts you in this world of like etiquette. I liked the song and I think it works for the scene for sure. And it's a good vibe. It's a very active song. It may be the most active one. Yeah, yeah. it's it's very fun and bouncy. Um, this one's pretty good. And also the puns and the clever kind of jokes about being proper when it doesn't really matter are pretty good. They're, it's a good yeah. song. So anyways, mm-hmm. reveal of Erica as Annalise and after it. Okay, so Erica uh, comes out as Annalise and the trick works. Nobody knows that the real Annalise is gone. They just think she's returned from being from running away. Uh, Preminger suspects the real Annalise has escaped. So he uh, leaves in a hurry. As he does, um, a piece of evergreen tree falls from his shoe. Julian inspects the foliage and realizes it's from a nearby wood. So he goes to investigate. Uh, we cut to the cabin, but Annalise has escaped the cabin before Preminger or Julian show up. So now she's gone. Preminger's confused why, if Annalise escaped, why she didn't mention she was kidnapped. Um, so Preminger's guessing there might be something up. Now Julian overhears that this is what's happened, that Preminger abducted him, but Julian makes a noise and then he himself gets abducted by Preminger. The plot thickens. You can see why I have so mo- so many notes because there's mm-hmm. so much interlaid stuff. Um, Annalise returns to the palace, but she's turned away. The guard believes she's an imposter because the guard says, I was just with the queen and the princess like for dinner. Right. So you're an imposter where you have to turn away. Because Annalise does not know that Erica is impersonating her as part of the plan. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and this is so what I paused it. This is, I think I, I watched this Saturday night after work. And this is when I was like, I have to stop watching. I'm going to be taking notes for the next two hours because this is so, <laughs> there's so much. I did not expect yeah. her to go to the castle and be turned away. I knew the movie still had like 40 minutes left, but I didn't expect that. And I was like, there's so much plot and event. It is like shocking. Um, this movie's not boring. Even if you don't like right. it, I don't think you could dare call it boring because there's so much stuff happening. Um, so she's turned away and she says, all right, I'll go to Erica. I'll find Erica because she doesn't know Erica's in the castle. I'll find Erica and she can help me. 
She goes to get help, but she runs into Madame Carp, who then mistakes Annalise as Erica. So she says, you need to get back to work. <laughs> so she sends her back home. Uh, and then Annalise talks back to Madame Carp because she's the princess. Madame Carp thinks she's, I guess, she thinks Erica's lost her mind. Is like, you're talking back to me. Fine, I'm going to lock you up. And you have to finish all these dresses by tomorrow morning. So Annalise has now got locked up again <laughs> and is now stuck. Um, and this is when like my brain was just like spinning and I had like the, the, the many SpongeBob's and the filing cabinets were running around going, Oh my gosh, what's happening? What's happening? Um, just nuts. So anyways, Annalise comes up with a plan to escape uh, her new <laughs> in draft location. I mean, this is as complicated as a saw movie. It's ridiculous. Um, Annalise says, I'll have Serafina go to the castle wearing a necklace, and the necklace will have a piece of Madame Carp's, like um, a label from one of her dresses, which um, I think they they even show that the label was beneath and between one of the seams of the dress, which I think is genuine. That's how they do it yeah. with dresses. So this is good attention to detail. Um, I wonder if the dolls also have that. That would be really cool if you could cut open the doll dress. Yeah, and you would see that'd be that the, really interesting. It'd be like a really interesting detail. But she says, if I send Serafina back to the castle with this note, they will know I'm here. <laughs> so that's her plan. I think that's when I decided I need to go to bed and I'll finish the movie tomorrow. <laughs> okay, so Erica's first day is on Elise. Um, this is really great narrative follow through. So in the song about them being the same, Annalise talks about what her morning is and she says how she wakes up in the morning and she's given breakfast and all this stuff. And then here in the morning, we get narrative follow through. She wakes up and this woman comes in to give her breakfast. Here's why I think this is a good thing is because there are so many movies where conversation either is one of two things. One, it's so obviously a setup that you know it's going to come back later. Mm -hmm. And I never like that. And then two, it's mentioned, but it never comes back. So it's just sort of random dialogue. And that's okay. The best dialogue, I think, is when it's a mixture of the two. It is something to be character set up. And you don't know it's going to come back as a payoff. And this is one of those things where like the song has a lyric about this, but I just thought it was just character development. But it ends up turning out to be something we'll follow through with uh, uh, narratively. Like this, uh, that's good writing. I liked it. We all um, uh, get some good hijinks with that, too. We also learn that the ambassador is King Dominic. Who could have guessed? <laughs> right. Not me, because I did not expect that. I'm sorry. Oh, you did <laughs> No. <laughs> I thought it was, but then they said it wasn't him. So my brain went, oh, it's not him. <laughs> <laughs> I, when I saw him, I thought uh, it. I I may have missed the ambassador part. I thought we knew he was the king already, and he was just... Didn't have his crown on. Honestly. Because he just looks like a Ken <laughs> doll. That's what I thought too. But then they said it was like he wasn't the king. And I was like, oh, okay. He's not the king. <laughs> I guess you'll follow with someone else. Yeah, I think I just missed that detail. Uh, and the whole time I thought he was the king until he apologizes. And I was like, oh, I guess I <laughs> wasn't supposed to know he was the king. Okay, it's fine. It's too but funny. Yeah. yeah, my brain is so funny. Been itching for Cinematic Doctrine merch? check out the support tiers on Patreon. We're offering merch to those who support at select tiers. So head on over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine and share your support. There's a link in the show notes too. Uh, okay. So we learned, yeah, that King Dominic is the uh, ambassador. No, is the page or the whatever. It's, is not who we thought it was if you were right. six years old or Melvin Benson. So, um, <laughs> His reason for being secretive, though, is that he didn't. He wanted to get to know the princess, not through pretension, not through being the king, and therefore having to be uh, expect respect, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so, anyways, um, and he specifically says, "I'm sure she also doesn't want to get married to someone she doesn't know." So there's like that's pretty cool. I like that. Uh, so we get into song five, "Never Change." This song is probably the most expendable song, comes in 50 minutes in, but it may be my favorite song. This is when Erica is, um, she's in the bathtub and she sings to her cat. Her <laughs> and cat dog. Your cat dog, since the cat is trying to meow so that they can continue to fit in. 
and it can't meow. And so she just says, I love you the way you are. It is so cute. I actually um, got teared up listening to it. Oh my I gosh, it was, it really was so cute. sweet. It, it's the only is... song I remember from the whole thing. It's adorable. It's, it is so cute. She just sings to her cat about how it, it's just got, but it's got like really, really, it, it's so funny how hard they go with the lyrics for this song yes. about singing to this cat. The lyrics were so encouraging. Cause They're it, so touching. Because that's the thing. It's like you can you can think about, you know, yourself and maybe any ways that you try to fit in with other people. And then um, hearing that you can you can be the way you are. So like for me, that would be like the... I re- it, and it goes back and I only bring it up because it goes back into the Barbie episode where I talked about my hair and how there was just such this long season where I felt like my curly hair wasn't as good as having my hair be straight. Mm-hmm. Just kind of seeing other girls with straight hair, seeing a lot of people like in like celebrities and things like that, people straight, 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 straight hair and feeling like my hair had to be straight in order for me to be like pretty Mm -hmm. and so just to kind of have this like affirmation that you know you're beautiful the way that you are i mean it's just it's a cat but you'd like little if i had seen that as a kid (laughs) well first of all this came out when i was like 15 so i by that point i wasn't playing with barbies anymore yeah (laughs) but if i was little at that time i would have i would have really appreciated a message like that and so i just and the melody was just like really really it's pretty. a really pretty song it's a nice it's a nice song that that one is definitely something that of all the songs in this i i enjoyed that one the most yeah it's and it's specifically singing about like these things that you don't like about yourself that you ostensibly do not have to not like because they are just who you are not it's not uh, i think you can i can i can in my brain i can imagine there's someone saying like well you know we're christian there are things about yourself you shouldn't like it's like yeah the sin parts but this is about yes the this parts is about that the, aren't that. <laughs> the outward the outward appearance like he's literally trying to he's a cat that barks and that's just it <laughs> like it's it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's just yeah so it's, it's just not like um, he committed murder <laughs> like, right it's okay. it's so uh, yeah man no it's, it's so just sweet. it's it's really sweet and i think even for kids who may feel like ugly like who may feel that they're ugly on the yeah. outside because they just don't look or act in a way that is more um mainstream i think is I don't know. I just thought it was really, really sweet. And and also, it's just she's singing to her pet. <laughs> like, it's, yeah, it's like trying everyone's to make her done pet that. Feel better. It's <laughs> yeah. so cute. Yeah, it's it's anyway. just amazing. Um, and so King Dominic overhears the song too. Um, and so what's funny though is she's in this giant room taking a bath, and then she gets out and and puts on clothing. We don't first of say all, anything. it's just a children's thing. But he's coming into the room. That's just what I was about to say. I'm like. What? What you opening the door for? That's not your room. Did yeah. you knock? <laughs> like, it was crazy. I'm like, I was, I was like, you better not walk in there, or I'm gonna be really. Oh, upset. me and Catherine had such a good laugh over that. It's so uh, funny, and of course he doesn't he see so anything. Nosy. He steps out, but it's so funny. Like, yeah, he's just he's he does he opens it to listen, not yeah. to like. But um, children shouldn't do that. <laughs> but cats it's do like, so maybe that's what the point was just, right it's like don't just like open the door to be nosy like you're supposed to knock anyway so anyways meanwhile Annalise is still making dresses at the um it is now the next day and Annalise is finishing making some dresses um Erica is escorted to the king by Preminger but possibly a ruse it isn't it actually just ends up being nothing um King Dominic then plays piano but says Annalise um of course, we know is Erica. I'm just going to call her Annalise because they think it's Annalise. Um, King Dominic plays piano and says Annalise will sing for me too because I know she sings well. And we get another song, song number six. I just wrote Heart. That I wrote the title was Heart That Lies Within. I don't actually know the title. 56 minutes in, it's another duet. I like how he's playing the piano and then he gets up and the piano is still playing. Yeah, I thought that was cute. I wish yeah. they kept singing to each other because then the, the song, now this is an actual montage really of their kind of going on a date throughout this day. Right. Um, but they don't sing 
they're they're si- the song is playing and they're singing, but they're just kind of looking at each other. And I would have appreciated if they just did sing, like, because I I know it's not real. You can be cutting between the day and like having the song play. Um, but it also probably saved money not to have to animate their lips for this particular scene. You didn't have to, so it's fine. Um, but the uh, the content of it is that they are singing how they love each other. They're learning to love each other. And that they uh, they love each other for who they are, and they don't have to have pretension or anything. Meanwhile, it's a knowing song. We know that this Annalise is not Annalise; it's Erica. Right. And to really put the nail in the coffin, uh, or to really uh, I don't know the phrase, but you know what I'm saying. To really sell it, King Dominic says that she he's he's infatuated with her, and says there's no there's nothing there's no lie there's nothing behind uh, what she's doing. And he leaves and er- Erica immediately breaks down and is like, oh, my gosh, I'm lying. I'm lying to him. Aww, I'm not who I'm saying. Yeah. So it's good drama. It's like, really, that's like that is there's a lot of complicated drama that it's just it's just good. OK, so we continue forward and um, Serafina arrives at the castle with the note. But Midas and Preminger immediately capture her. Um, Preminger finds Annalise is, uh, at the, at Madame Carp's and first Annalise is like, finally, you can take me home. Uh, Preminger then takes her to the mines. Annalise realizes I'm being taken to the mines because I'm being abducted again. It was Preminger. It was Preminger the whole time. Um, and so, but it's too late. Preminger carries her into the mines and, uh, we find Julian was also abducted and taken into the mines too. So they're tossed into the same area. Um, Preminger locks the door. So they're stuck inside, but to make matters worse, um, Preminger on the outside has Nick and the other guy break down the mine shaft. And so now they're trapped inside, collapsed into this cave, um, and we think they might be dead. Uh, so the plot has really thickened. Um, Preminger then returns home and also, um, oh, he also, when he had left, he had taken her ring because cause, uh, she had... Um, when she was at Madame Carp's and she sent the note on Serafina, she also included her royal wing, royal ring to say, like, this is evidently me. Yeah. But Preminger had taken it. And so when he knocks down the mine shaft, he also is taking the ring because he's going to say that she died. Um, so Preminger goes to the uh, kingdom and he outs Erica and says, it's an imposter. Look, she doesn't have the birthmark. It's not her hair. Um, uh, and here's... Th- Here's what Preminger says. He says, Julian has conspired against the kingdom to kill um, Annalise, and he was going to try and take the throne or something, or or something. Um, and he's going to defraud the king. He's going to defraud King Dominic as well um, and have this uh, pauper uh, marry uh, King Dominic. Um, and they kill they killed Annalise in the process. He shows off the ring and the queen gasps and freaks out. So everything seems to be falling apart, and Erica is taken to the dungeon. So we get two semi songs, I would say. We have uh, Erica, who is in the dungeon singing sadly um, and then breaks down into tears. And then we have Preminger doing an additional verse to his villain song as he proposes to the queen, saying, I have a ton of money. I can save the kingdom. Uh, your daughter's dead. Your husband's dead. You got no money. I will save the kingdom. You just need to marry me. So it seems like Preminger is going to win. Um, so let's see what our heroes do. So we see that Erica. Uh, sings a song that puts um, a guard guard to sleep so he can she can take the keys and escape. Meanwhile, um, Annalise and Julian, Julian, Annalise actually confesses her love to Julian, uh-huh. uh, who then reciprocates. And they try breaking out, but as they're trying to mine their way out, they hit water, so they're worried they're going to start drowning, so they have to just stop. So they're like, I guess we'll die. Um, and then Erica's cat, Wolfie, that's his name. Wolfie yes. ends up finding out how to get into the mine shaft because he can sniff a, an area where the ground is soft and he is able to go through and fall in. Uh, and then I said, before it happened, I said, oh, they can use the water. They can fill up the cave and lift themselves out through the hole, which is exactly what they do because we have all played Minecraft at some point in our life. So we know how to do this. So <laughs> they do exactly that. They, um, open up the water in the cave, which is cute because both Serafina and Wolfie are in the cave and they panic because they're cats. They don't like water. Um, again, good attention to detail for some good jokes. Um, they lift themselves out. The wedding is about to happen between the queen and Preminger, but uh, the everybody shows up in time. Erica, King Dominic had also helped Erica escape. So King Dominic and Erica, who both 
now know that it's Erica, um, confess their love to each other as well. So everybody gets their Ken. Um, they stop the wedding. Preminger tries to escape on a horse. Uh, and then the Kens ride a horse, which I was not expecting and didn't realize until Catherine points and goes, horses, the Kens are on horses, the patriarchy. <laughs> <laughs> and so, <laughs> That's right. And so I was like, oh, oh my gosh. gosh. So I then I that. wondered, I, I wondered, I was like, does every Barbie movie have horses? That would be great if it does. Oh my gosh. <laughs> which would, that would be amazing. Probably is, there probably is crossover between Barbie girls and horse girls. So that would make sense. Um, but. As they're chasing Preminger, Preminger is kicked off of his own horse because the horse also talked and uh, doesn't like Preminger. So uh, Preminger is then captured, taken to the dungeon. Um, we get some brief aftermath. Um, yeah, I guess there aren't any, uh, there are no more songs at this point. Um, the, there's some brief aftermath where Erica says she's going to go explore now that she's free. And King Dominic says, take this ring. And Erica says, no promises, which I thought was very romantic. Mm. Um, but she still takes the ring. And King Dominic's like, I'll wait for you. It's very sweet. <laughs> and I thought they were going to end it there. I was like, oh, that's such a romantic, very complicated ending for this kid's movie. Yes. Um, but then but we I'm get glad some... they didn't end it there. Yes. I, I am also glad that they then end it on the toy selling ending uh, where they then <laughs> return. Erica has now returned. It's been a couple of years. I think they said five years later. And uh, Annalise and Julian and then Erica and King Dominic get married at the same time. And then have their honeymoon at the same time to get on the horse carriage that takes them off. Weird. Because that's the toy. Uh, and so yes. then the movie ends. And uh, I don't know. If you, did you turn the movie off immediately at the ending? I was just curious if you saw the credits. Um, I saw a little bit of the credits where it was like the bloopers. Bloopers! There's Which I thought bloopers. was so <laughs> cute. Yeah. But I like it because it says Barbie stars in the film The Princess and the Popper. So it's yeah. like she's on a film set. So I thought that was really cute. I was so curious if they did that for all the other ones too. Now I, now I have to watch really all the Barbie movies. Um, there's at least one other I wanted to watch. So there was the other one that was on the patreon vote but yeah there's bloopers i love animated bloopers and it's not the kind that were on the shrek dvd where it shows uh anim animatics that were broken which are also objectively funny um, yes. these are faux bloopers like in veggie tales where it's like or like a bug's life yeah like a bug's life that. where they put in yeah, new scenes that end, are like yeah. silly one of the characters phone goes off one of the character break dances it's like stuff like that very yeah. fun love it just very cool very cute and then yeah additionally it be it plays up the idea that barbie's real and, and lives mm -hmm. in this barbie land world um so you can almost imagine that the margot robbie barbie is the same barbie it's just cute um okay we made it to the end though um i guess we'll we'll do it party pleaser or party pooper you get us started <sighs> um... oh no a sigh that's not I feel like I'm like how you felt the one time you were like I has and I yelled at you. You have to choose. Yep. We have to choose. <laughs> I'm going to choose party pleaser. I'm going to choose party pleaser because there's just so like I would have no problem showing this if, to my children if I had if I had my own children or like showing it in the classroom mm -hmm. because I think it's wholesome. I think it's intricate, but not in a way that's too overwhelming for a child to understand. Um, I think it's honest. I really loved the ending where Erica decides she's like, I want to experience the world and figure out who I am. Yes, I like that. You know, on my own before I could even decide if if this is what I want to, because I don't even like know you know you. Like, yes. you know, so she takes time and realizes that she does love him, that she does want to spend her life with him. I liked that. Um, and I, yeah, I, I liked, I liked the story. The muse, the only reason why I leaned, I was possibly thinking about Party Pooper was just that, I mean, it's not my favorite animated, you know, movie. I didn't think it yes. was, um, the best one that I've seen. And even the music was kind of lacking with the exception of just that one song that I thought was just absolutely precious. Um, but I, but I didn't hate the movie and mm -hmm. I wouldn't not recommend it. Um, it's, it's, yeah. So I, I, I think I would just lean more towards party pleaser. I think it's really cute. If you want to show it to the kids, there were parts where I, I did feel like I was a little bit bored, but I'm just not the Barbie audience. And I think <laughs> that's just, that's just me. Like I, I don't have this like deep connection with it, but it's cute. It's really cute. 
Mm -hmm. I'm going to say Party Pleaser 2. I actually think this would be objectively funny to watch with some friends. Not to laugh at. Like, not to make fun of. Because I I would actually find that really mean. But to because it is so it, it it's it's fun enough in its narrative that it borders on political drama which is kind of fun um its complications are all fun in a way that are like silly mm-hmm. i think everyone would be crying over the singing to the cat song too just because everyone loves their pet so that's Aww. just like i just envisioned like watching with friends and everyone's just awing and like just like this uncontrolled awing that like it's just super funny to me um and then yeah it's just like it's it's so harmless like i almost could imagine it would be more of a background movie where you'd put it on and people would talk but you'd kind of had fun listening to the music and and watching it and then the animation also is funny too to to see sometimes because it just looks so yeah i don't know like just like Ugh. it's just like sometimes it's not good like yeah not because it's it's bad there's parts that are just ugly yeah and like and they're it's never barbie polished. it's never barbie is ugly barbie always right. looks good and even ken looks maybe too polished to be in it but like there are yeah. some additional characters that are all like Ugh. and then yeah preminger is so Ugh. yeah <laughs> it's just but terrible I, but i liked that uh, though yeah I exactly it's that. it's the it's a good villain set. say uh, yeah you know i think this one was fun like this was yeah it's cute I I was happy to do it. And then also, yeah, it's just like it fits in the theme with the summer of Barbie. So you may not know this, but the easiest way you can show your support for Cinematic Doctrine is to rate and review the podcast on iTunes, Spotify or wherever you listen. So press pause and share your thoughts. We'd love to hear what you have to say and then press play again so you can hear the rest of the show. Recommendations. Let's end. Uh, let's end it now. Uh, what do you got for recommendation? I have the Swan Princess. So this was a movie that I did grow up watching, and it's 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 kind of been talked about more in recent, like the recent years. I think, like maybe, I want to say I noticed people talking about it more, like starting last year. And it's just, I'll, I'll, let me talk about the movie first. Melanie, (laughs) what are your thoughts? Um, You have these two kingdoms, one led by a king, the other led by a queen. They're kind of old in age and they want to come together by bring their kingdoms together by having their children marry. But what I love is that the kids absolutely hate each other. You know, they're kids when they're met and they're told they have to marry each other and they're like, ew, gross. So you have this relationship that even as they get older takes an interesting turn, which I won't spoil for people. I want you to like watch it and experience it for yourself. But whatever, whatever the plans were for their marriage, they get, they get thwarted by an evil power hungry sorcerer who curses the princess to live as a swan by day. Um, So it's a tale, it's a tale. Yes. It's like a fairy tale about, about love and about, um, doing what's right and, ha- um, and facing your fears and, um, just even there are these, the reason why I recommended it was because like the Barbie movie, I feel like there are moments where they break their traditional fairy tale story and make the characters more relatable. There's a, there's a very famous scene. Again, I won't spoil it that people like to reference on social media just because it's just so, it's just so perfect. You know, Derek says something and then oh, the the prince and then Odette has this like great response. And um, just even just seeing her bravery throughout this whole ordeal, I think is just really um, inspiring. And, and just seeing like their love for each other come together, not like snap, oh, we're in love, but how it's something that grows over time, mm-hmm. I think is also just something that's really precious and sweet. And yeah. Um, yeah, this is just great. It's a great movie. I'm also going to recommend um, <clears throat> kind of an accessible kids movie, but obviously it's a silly one. Um, obviously, because I'm so silly, um, <laughs> I'm going to recommend B movie, ridiculous, silly, ridi- absurd movie. It's so good. Like I yeah, really like B movie. I think cute. it's so funny. Um, and of course, the making of and everything is so funny too. Where Seinfeld basically jokingly pitched this movie about a bee, 
and then like the producer was like i'll make it and so then they like on a gag like made this yeah. whole movie it's it's pretty freaking funny and um I don't really need to sell it. You already know about it, but but watch it again because it's a ton of fun. Uh, a bee falls in love, gets to know a grown woman who is in a committed relationship with a human man. <laughs> and, oh and I say fall in love, but they become friends. But they play up the romance stuff because it's funny. Um, and then also turns into a court drama because he learns all these humans are taking their honey. And he's like, I cannot believe it. This is our honey. We work for this. And so <laughs> it's it's ridiculous. It's Explaining it is like trying to explain the entirety of the scriptures in like five minutes. I guess I could just say the gospel, but that's there's so much more to talk about. Um, so yeah, I did yeah. compare the, Bi- the Bible to B-Movie. Um, it's a modern Bible of the age, so... Check it out. I'm sure it's streaming basically everywhere still, but it's a ton of fun. Um, and you'll have some good laughs. Check it out with friends. Have some beers. It's good. Thanks so much for checking out this episode of Cinematic Doctrine. If you enjoyed this episode, consider leaving a review and subscribing to the podcast. And as mentioned before, Cinematic Doctrine has a Patreon. For as little as $3 a month, you're opted into a once a month movie poll where you decide a movie we discuss on the podcast. There are other unique benefits that come with supporting the podcast, so be sure to check that out at patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine. A special shout out to those who support at the Art House Theater tier on Patreon. Thank you so much, Mom, Dad, Melanie, Sherlyon, and Thomas. You guys are the best, and your continued monetary support is greatly appreciated. Until next time, stay cool. Want some Cinematic Doctrine swag? You're in luck! We've got 3-inch Cinematic Doctrine logo stickers exclusive for Patreon supporters. Perfect for your travel mug or laptop. Head over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine, link in the show notes, and choose the independent theater tier. Doing so will net you other perks too. But let's be real, the podcast stickers are the coolest perk. So get yourself some podcast stickers by supporting on Patreon.